Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. Joining me, as always, is the editor in chief, Miss Miriam McNabb of DroneLife.com. Miriam, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Paul, how are you today? I'm doing good. No complaints. So that means it is a good day. Excellent. Excellent. So our first piece of news is actually not about drones at all, but it's really important to content creators and uh, drone pilots. So what do you know about the new MacBook that just came out? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, Miriam, that this is not really drone related, but definitely augments a lot of drone based businesses, a lot of creative businesses as Apple did launch two new MacBook Pros yesterday. And seemingly the coverage that I've seen, I think, kind of misses the main points that are really important to discuss regarding this new Apple computer. Uh, Number one is Apple is bringing back that very cool thing that we call MagSafe charging so that if your dog or child runs into your computer cord, uh, your laptop will not seemingly uh, break in a million pieces and the cord will just disconnect. But they also brought back the HDMI port and the SD card port. Now, the one big thing that I think is really huge and I haven't heard talked about really anywhere is typically when you buy a smaller MacBook Pro, uh, the processing power is a little bit throttled because of essentially thermal dynamics. It can't cool the processor as much as necessary. Well, with Apple's new chipset, if you do buy the smaller 14-inch MacBook Pro, the processor and really all the infrastructure of the computer is not throttled at all. So you can get full power in a very small form factor. So frankly, Miriam, I think this new uh, MacBook Pro is going to be probably the computer that a lot of us creatives have been waiting for as we don't have to spend a lot of erroneous money on dongles anymore and have a backpack full of cords. Sounds good. That'll be great news for commercial drone operators, you know, moving around and and, uh, you got to get the data, but then you got to process the data. So sounds good. You sure do. You sure do. All right. So our next piece of news, I think we were going to talk about uh, a company who is marketing themselves as creatives. What's the latest news in the ongoing saga of DJI and uh, the U.S. government? Well, I will say, Miriam, it seems like ever since uh, Brendan Schulman left, uh, the United States is taking a much stricter stance against uh, DJI. As today, the FCC is announcing a new investigation against DJI, um, saying specifically that DJI drones and the surveillance technology on board these systems are collecting vast amounts of sensitive data, everything from high resolution images of critical infrastructure to facial recognition, uh, really, uh, technology and remote sensors that can measure an individual's body temperature and even heart rate. Uh, The FCC chairman stated, we do not need an airborne version of Huawei. Uh, And you know, Miriam, we've talked about the security issues with DJI numerous times. And I have to say, this kind of new ramped up enforcement from various uh, agencies in the U.S. government continues to negate the one very simple truth about the security issue with these drones, which is you can solve it by just not allowing the drone to connect to the Internet. I mean, it's, it's really basic stuff here. And so it does seem very politically charged. And even like I was telling you in pre-show, I, I, I was reading an article uh, on, a, on a pretty, pretty far right uh, news network stating that Biden was buying all these Chinese drones. But what I do like is that the FCC chairman even stated that our customers know that DJI drones remain the most capable and the most affordable products for a wide variety of uses, including sensitive industrial and government work. So I like the fact that at least the FCC chairman is saying, hey, we realize there's nothing that even comes close to these, but uh, we're still going to investigate it. So it really makes you wonder what's really behind all of this. Yeah, I think this is just um, one more step in what 
uh, you know, we know of as the Huawei effect, where uh, sort of the U.S. has made a real effort to limit their exposure to Chinese technology and whether or not that's really because of security concerns or because they want to support the domestic um industry or really because they were afraid that an interruption in uh, import export from China could seriously limit the functionality of drones in a lot of these departments. Um, but in any case, we're seeing bipartisan kind of attacks from different angles. And this one is now from the FCC. So we'll see what happens uh, with this. Eventually, I do think that it's kind of part of the whole effect that we've seen uh, over the last few years. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely interesting, which, well, helps us go into our next piece of drone news, Miriam. It really seems like counter UAS systems are becoming mainstream. What's going on here? Yeah, this is a really interesting thing that that um, it's kind of fun that we get to talk about these things on this show because while I can only publish a limited number of pieces every day, uh, the reality is that I have seen sort of five or six pieces of news come across my desk this last week from counter UAS companies. And I think that the trend is really, hey, these counter UAS companies um, started out sort of getting getting military contracts for military installations. Then they were going to kind of uh, larger industrial sites. And that's still maybe the bread and butter of some of these companies. But I think we're also seeing them in event spaces and, and just many more mainstream spaces. These counter UAS companies are out there. They're making money. They're updating their product lines. They're improving their offerings. They're becoming more portable, more effective, more cost effective. And I think that we're going to see uh, counter UAS technology kind of go hand in hand with with the development of commercial UAV technology, because I think that government agencies, large infrastructure, power companies feel more comfortable allowing commercial uh, drone technology near their sites when they already have counter UAS systems uh, in place to kind of say who's authorized and who's not authorized in that space. Yeah, definitely interesting to see the quick involvement of that uh, vertical of the industry and maybe with these increased uh, counter UAS technologies, well, it might inhibit, well, what we would call our next piece of news. Drug dealers rejoice as now you'll be able to carry 200 kilos across the border with this new electric heavy lift aircraft. But caveat, the counter UAS systems will probably see you and stop you. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam, what do you have? <laughs> that wasn't exactly how the press release presented it. <laughs> well, t- it wouldn't be our Drone Life News segment if we didn't talk about drone delivery in some way, shape, or form. And the latest in drone delivery is Volocopter's Volo Drone, which is a heavy lift all-electric VTOL. Um, cool stuff because I think when you talk about uh, residential drone delivery, you're still only talking about things that that weigh a couple pounds. You know that you you got your coffee, you, you've got your burrito. You can only have two burritos. You can't have four. Um, you've got sort of limited weight. Um, but when you're talking about cargo drones, it's kind of a whole nother ball game and a whole different set of really important use cases. So. If you imagine, for example, somebody is working out on a pipeline and they need a piece of equipment or they need um, some tools or or something like that, that's where a heavy lift drone on demand could be a huge savings in time and money for big industry. You know, on a mining site, any of these industrial sites, departments of transportation uh, and so forth. So heavy lift drone, cargo drone, 
really interesting technology, uh, clean environmentally over trucks, you know, more efficient in the supply chain because you can do sort of on demand uh, stuff. So really interesting to see uh, Volocopter's Volo drone um, take its first public flight this last uh, few weeks. So. Definitely takes the uh, delivery game to a new level by carrying that kind of uh, payload. Uh, But in the United States, with Part 107, that 55-pound aircraft limit uh, makes you wonder if they would need a uh, a waiver to be able to utilize this. But that brings us into our next story. It seems like the plan to finally get, well, urban air mobility or, or unmanned taxis is coming to a society near you. Just not in the USA, but rather in Australia. What's going on here, Miriam? Well, this is the latest in urban air mobility. And urban air mobility, for sure, is kind of on the edge of maybe what we thought when we started drone life. But I love talking about it and I love writing about it. So I always uh, cover those stories. I'm so excited for urban air mobility to come to a place near me. So there is a company, Skyports in Australia, has pledged to put the infrastructure in place to have air taxi service for the Brisbane Olympics, which I believe will take place in 2032, right? They're, they're going to build out this infrastructure to offer air taxi service um, at the Olympics. And I think this is this is kind of a good idea because you can maybe get it in place for the Olympics, gives people time to get ready for it. You're in the middle of major development uh, for the Olympic Games anyway, and maybe it won't go away after the Olympics. Here in the U.S., um, I have to say, you know, with the NASA Grand Challenge focused on urban air mobility and UTM, uh, the, the kind of relationship between those. And with Steve Dixon saying at some of the major drone events earlier this fall that he thought urban air mobility would be a reality within a few years. I think, um, you know, between a few years and 10 years, somewhere in there, we are going to see the first urban air mobility, uh, at least in some limited form. Yeah, it'll be interesting uh, to see how that goes. But I, I definitely think the, the infrastructure is being laid out. You know, like what what's included with this? You know, air taxi helipads all over Sydney? I mean... Yeah, really interesting to see kind of how those things work out because, um, you know, this is another element of drone technology and drone regulation. And it's important to say that too, where the standard hasn't really been established yet. You know, there are a lot of ideas for how vertiports, skyports should look and how uh, they should communicate with air traffic control and what routes should look like. And we don't really have a published standard for that that's accepted all over the world. So everybody's sort of working that out as we go. That's what makes it interesting. Interesting indeed. Uh, I like your uh, your vernacular, uh, vertiport. Did I hear that right? Vertiports, uh, that is one one particular company it does make vertiports. Uh, if you look on Drone Life, I have a lot of different articles on this. Some of the, there are some actually built and there are others that are just planned. And I have to say, I find um, both the actual structures and the concepts absolutely beautiful and exciting to look at. So, I mean, it could be anything. It can be um, from a rooftop or it can be a whole separate infrastructure uh, station. Wow. Probably changing building designs and standards in the process. Really? I mean, if you think about it, uh, I believe hotels in Las Vegas are already built with helipads on the top, right? So so there is probably an opportunity there, but uh, in other places, not every building is uh, is built with those facilities in mind, but maybe in the future they will be. Yeah, definitely. Wow, Miriam. Well, thank you so much for uh, for bringing us all this news and uh, new vernacular as well. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Paul. Always fun to be here. Definitely fun to have you as well. Thank you to everyone who is listening to the show. We do appreciate it. If you want to leave us a review wherever you watch the show or listen, we would greatly appreciate it. But that's going to do it from both of us today. Thanks again for watching another episode of Drone Life News.